In this presentation, we will explore the muscle names, origins, insertions and actions most relevant to equitation. In this module, we will distinguish between different joint types, name the muscles involved with each locomotor joint, describe position and actions of equine locomotor and spinal support muscles, perform passive evaluation tests to determine any asymmetry present in a variety of joints. Let's first take a look at the three types of joints. Sine arthrodial, that's fixed for strength and stability, such as in the skull sutures, suture being another word for stitch, and they do look like stitches, close up, there's some here also. Amphiarthrodial, meaning that it's surrounded by cartilaginous tissue, as we can see in the hock where there are seven separate bones forming the hock joint. There is slight movement in the hock joints, in amphiarthrodial joints. Diarthrodial, that means they're relatively free, yet stable. And they're contained within a ligamentous capsule, binding the joints together, protecting from aberrant movement. And this is the coxofemoral joint or the hip joint. Range of motion is dependent on a sufficient blood supply. Muscles have to cross joints in order for them to move. They pull, they never push, but we'll take a closer look at that in the biomechanics module. They're limited by various physical barriers, for example, joint capsule tension. As one side flexes, the other side compresses. So in the wrist, for example, as I flex my wrist, the other side compresses. The equine pelvic limb is specialised and it's a system of bone congruency and soft tissue structures providing passive simultaneous support to the stifle and hock joints. They flex and extend as one reciprocal unit, so whatever the stifle joint does, the hock joint must also do as a reciprocal apparatus. And the problem with this system is that if the peroneus tertius muscle ruptures, then this will be the result. And as you can see, there is almost 180 degree extension while there's still flexion in the stifle joint. Let's take a look at the individual muscles of the equine head and upper neck. And the illustrations have been created as a visual guide to memory. And for this reason, placement is not always entirely precise as they are created to show the approximate position of their origins and insertions for learning purposes. Extensors and elevators will be shown in shades of red, flexors in green and rotators or other movement in yellow. And you will note that depending on where and how the muscle is sighted in relation to its associated bony levers, this determines its action. So with this visual guide, you will be able to make a fair assumption of the actions of muscles by considering their origins and insertions. I've aimed to make this as applied as possible to make it more meaningful so as to enhance learning rather than tackle the learning of muscle function by rote. That would not be useful at all. And keep in mind that muscles do not operate in isolation and their roles may change from agonist to stabiliser, for example depending on the movement being executed, 
particularly for sports performance. And they will also change in relation to whether the body part is in open or closed kinetic chain, that is with or without ground contact. And while some reference will be made to movement, that topic is reserved for the biomechanics module. For now, focus on names and actions. So muscles with cranium insertion are the cranial oblique capitis, which originates on the cranial border of the atlas to insert on the nuchal crest so that it will have slight lateral flexion and rotation, but bilaterally, both together, it will extend with some rotation. The superficial capitis group of capitis dorsalis major, minor, ventralis and lateralis and longus, which singly rotate and laterally flex the cranium in this direction. When recruited together, they will extend the head. Longus capitis originates at C3, 4 and 5 and inserts on the mastoid process. You'll note that the others insert, insert on the axis and atlas. And you can see which of these muscles is directly involved with operating the atlanto-occipital joint here. And this muscle looks like it would act more like a stabilizer in that situation. Longissimus is a muscle which is formed in separate sections as a spinal flexor from cranium to sacrum and is considered as one continuous muscle. Here is the cranium attachment of that muscle which originates from T3, third thoracic, along to C3, so here missing out the atlas and the axis to insert on the cranium. Semispinalis capitis rotates and laterally flexes the cranium and the neck. But when the pair are recruited together, they will extend it. And you can see again, there is some origins on the caudal ver the cervical vertebrae and it misses out the atlas and the axis. Brachiocephalicus flexes the neck ventrally, so this way. And when the neck is fixed by other muscles to support it, it becomes a limb protractor. So the limb will move in this direction. Splenius is in two parts, and this is the dorsal portion, splenius capitis. It originates on the nuchal funiculum fascia and the thoracic vertebra three, four and five and inserts on the nuchal crest and it moderates head movement at speed with a buffering action and when recruited only on one side so that's when it acts as a pair on one side or singly lateral flexion You will have noticed that the more extensive muscles with occipital insertions originate towards the trunk region. And this appears to leave this occipito atlanto axial joint fairly free moving. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The articulating surfaces of the cranium the occipital condyles are ellipsoidal. 
which means spherical or rounded. And this means that the atlas tracks in a dorsal or a ventral movement, not laterally. I'll show you this. So they're very rounded. Can you see? And if I take an atlas, place it in here. So I'll just show you the articulating surface of the atlas. Place it here. It will not move sideways. It moves because it's ellipsoidal or rounded. When it moves, it will move dorsally and it will close the gap between the wing of Atlas and the mandible. Therefore, when we palpate the gaps in the space between the atlas and mandible, we're feeling for how much the atlas has moved upwards, not sideways. Because the cranial oblique capitis has its origins and insertions with the atlas and cranium, it can be implicated together with the capitis group of muscles. There is limited atlantoaxial muscle attachment, thus leaving the capacity for free movement in a pod style arrangement, leaving the coupling to bring about the yes and the no movements of flexion and extension. Muscle tendon strain can be severe in this region because of the leverage, despite the support given to it by the nuchal ligament, which is actually very elastic. And rain leverage being the highest risk to this region via harsh hands or bits. Pulling back when tied can cause moderate to severe strain in this region. If you recall the capitus muscles all crossing here. And there may be avulsion injury. Avulsion meaning that tendons or ligaments can be torn from their fixings either partially or completely. And misalignment of the atlas typically mirrors contralateral dorsoventral pelvic asymmetry and restriction of the pelvis. So restriction on the left atlas will usually mean restriction on the right pelvis. So here and restriction on the right pelvis diagonally. First, stand in front of the horse and look for any static asymmetry. So here, for example, we can see the head is tilted this way. Then evaluate the gap between the wing of atlas and the mandibular ramus. So the jaw and the wing of atlas. Stand in front of the horse and to one side and place two or three fingers under each ear and slowly sweep down. And the fingers that reach the bone first are in the narrowest gap. So two hands together with the fingers and just sweep down. Evaluate the fluency and weight of passive extension Stand in front of the horse, grasp the head collar and lift in one 20 to 40 centimetre sweep. Step to the right or left, <laughs> returning to the centre, then step to the other side. Compare sides to evaluate which side feels heavier or more resistant or restricted. And the restricted side will typically be 
the side with the narrowest gap. Placing a hand over the insertions of the capitus muscle group and the other on the maxilla or the nose. Laterally flex the head towards you and feel for any flicking of the muscles as they track over the atlas. And they can be acutely hypertonic as to really bounce over the atlas. And that is very palpable under your hand. And that must be painful for the ridden horse. And repeat it on the other side and watch for a pain response typically seen in the horse's eyes. These tests cannot be performed on horses with dental imbalance or parotid gland enlargement. And here's a video of all of those tests. So first being for the gap. Then the extension. side and the other side and then lateral flexion palpating for any flicking or reaction from the horse under your hand The atlantoaxial joint is the articulation between C1 and C2. The axis is formed from a dens, which is a spherical prong-like structure, such as this. And it inserts into the corresponding convex surface of the caudal or the back of the atlas, like this. Some degree of rotation is facilitated. Both of these vertebrae are highly specialised. They are distinct and different from each other and from the remaining cervical vertebrae, which are very boxy. And it's not difficult to appreciate how easily strain can occur in this region if this joint complex, and complex it is, is fixed in hyperflexion. The test for axis segment restriction is lateral flexion and the gap between the wing of the atlas here and the ramus of the mandible here should flex to 45 degrees when C2 is anchored. But allowance has to be made for age and older horses may flex to around 20 degrees half of that of a young horse. Take several seconds to complete the flexion and observe the horse's reaction. How fluent is the movement? Is there any guarding, any signs of pain in the eye or pulling away? And there'll be a few degrees of rotation with this move as for this horse, which is normal. But this horse prefers to rotate much more than flex, as you can see on both sides. And this horse doesn't flex at all, but it compensates by flexing through C3. And I need his head to flex, lateral flexion in this area here. So here to here. A 
but I don't like the rotating. And yet he seems to be flexing, wanting to flex through C3. Yeah. Can you see that? It was completely different. Yes. Yeah. The occipito atlanto axial joint is the name given to the joint segments of the occiput, atlas, and axis. There is flexion, extension, rotation and buffering in this very limited area or region. And it moderates head stability as a balance tool. And the atlas has a prominent transverse process, these. but no dorsal spinous process. And the axis has no transverse processes, but a substantial dorsal spinous process. It's a coupled system, as I demonstrated earlier, this, this, and the occipito atlantal joint and multifidus the long muscle or the extensive muscle which occurs between vertebrae to stabilize them is not present in this region so keep in mind that they are mechanically linked so that addressing the atlas or the yes movement in therapy should include the no joint because that is involved insofar as targeting the axis for treatment will resolve the atlas movement issues. So when you think you're going to treat this, you need to treat this also. The caudal oblique capitus muscle links the atlas and the axis and can be a sizable thick muscle, several centimetres thick in the developed horse and it rotates the atlas and the head as a good example of that coupled movement even though that muscle has no attachment to the cranium. Omo transversarius originates on the brachial fascia to laterally flex the neck and assist brachiocephalicus, which we looked at earlier, with limb protraction when the neck is fixed. So you should be getting by now that wherever these muscles insert and originate, that is the parts of the body or the parts of the skeleton that are moved. Longissimus atlantis elevates the head and you can see the longissimus muscle in its entirety, which you will be familiar with, uh, which extends through the back. This is the cervical portion and it's another muscle that misses out one of those coupled vertebrae. 